The world is old and the powers are weary. The god at the door of night has fallen and the great enemy of the world has come back from the timeless void. The shadow has awakened the great evils to regain dominion over Ardar. Darkness shall cover the land if not for the deeds of a small fellowship of elf friends. Join the players of this Dungeons & Dragons campaign as they fulfill the events of the Dagor Daggeroth prophecy and strive with Morgoth on the plains of Valinor. Welcome to the Undying Lands in Part 3 of the Glory and Bastards trilogy, Trials of the Valor. Alright, welcome everybody to episode 131 of the Inglorian Bastards podcast. Um, and this this episode is a little strange. I've only done, I think, one of these every 50 episodes. And this is where you just get me talking. <laughs> uh, this is kind of a, an introspective. This is me sort of looking back on the last 130 episodes and looking forward the the last 20 episodes which are, are kind of going to be a mix of of um, different types of episodes which i'll talk about in a little bit i'm kind of nearing the end of of my time with the D and and the tolkien community i will be switching gears after the, uh, part three of of this to a different dungeons and dragons campaign i'll be sort of uh, closing the door on tolkien at least in terms of the podcast uh, we'll never close my heart to tolkien but i wanted to start this episode by just looking back a little bit and giving a, a few dates it is june of 2020 June 25th, to be precise. And about three years ago, uh, on June 11th, 2017, we began playing this Adventures in Middle Earth campaign. Uh, we started the podcast on November 2nd, 2018. My last episode here, if, I, if I'm able to stick to my schedule, will be on August 31st, 2020. Over three years of my life, I've dedicated to this story um, this D and D campaign, these players, my listeners, and this podcast, and and to learning more about J.R.R. Tolkien and what he's all about, right? And you don't get that just by reading The Hobbit or just by watching the Lord of the Rings movies. I've started thinking about the sort of the that rabbit hole that that I keep talking about with, with the various people that I interview. And that's really, you know, I think Corey was the first, uh, Corey Olson was the first to sort of mention that term. But I, I think there are five levels. I would, I would define five levels of uh, Tolkienhood, right? If you're uh, of, uh, like, how much Kool Aid are you drinking? So I, I think the sort of the top level where you can kind of just poke your head in the, the rabbit hole and just look around a little bit are, are the folks that, that have just watched the movie. They will watch some of the movies. God help us if it's just The Hobbit. But, you know, that's kind of a cursory level. And the, the, you, if you want to go a little deeper, those are the folks that have probably seen the movies and and or at least read sort of the core canon, which I would which I would define as at least The Lord of the Rings uh, and maybe The Hobbit as well. And I think I think level th three of this rabbit hole, the people that go in pretty pretty deep, and I, and usually I think this is probably. You know, people don't go much. Generally speaking, the general population doesn't go much deeper than this. These these are the people that read the Silmarillion. You know, I was somewhere between level three and level four when I started the podcast. Uh, I think I think level four we could define as the people who have read this sort of um, what I'm calling the extra writings, right? The unfinished tales, the histories of Middle Earth, the on fairy stories, uh, Tolkien's other things like Beowulf. Those are the I think I think the that's going really deep. That <laughs> most people don't go that far, and I think I think probably the fifth level are are the people are, are kind of like a portrait of of this level five person would be um, some of the people that I've interviewed, right? Some of the people that I'm going to interview. I'm thinking about the people that have have done all the things that I've just talked about, but as well as like going the extra mile to, to go to Marquette or to Baldlian or to, you know, like James Tauber break down the text. And he, you know, I think James said he had like, like, I don't know how many different versions of the Silmarillion, but to really sort of get into the text and around, um, study the word choice and the, um, the variation from, from version to version. I, I think some, I'm probably in, in, 
you know, level four pretty solidly in level four now. That, I think that's why it's been so interesting for me is that, you know, the people that I'm interviewing are all level fives and, and are able to teach me things. If, if, if I had to sort of go a little bit deeper to that level five, the area that I would choose to study would be something that Verlin Flieger and I talked about. And that that's the sort of the parallels between, you know, Tolkien's Lost Road unfinished work and his the the concept of sort of the path of dreams this this road that you can travel on in your dreams and and i think what's clear through all of tolkien's writings is that he had this belief that there are these these things that you can pass down from generation to generation that that are not tangible and that and that there are there are avenues that you can travel dream being one of them that that will allow you to see back into the past and to have shared experiences with you know, ancestors or people that have come before. And um, if if I were a young man and just getting a PhD, I think that's probably what I would study. But I'm not. <laughs> so, you know, for me, having a having a definitive end to, to this podcast is uh, is is really good. I think you know. Being able to sort of close the door after the last battle, uh, maybe having a, a, a special last episode um, like we've done in episode 50 and episode 100. But, but then to be able to sort of close the door and shift gears and go on to something else creative, I think that's what keeps me going every day. I wake up thinking about what story am I going to tell today? Would I have done anything differently over the over the last three years? Well, I think first and foremost, I felt very self-conscious about the name that I had chosen for the podcast. It, was, it started off as like a sort of joke amongst the players or a joke for the players and, and it sort of became the, the title of my podcast. And, and, and I felt very self-conscious when I interviewed Berlin Flieger. And that was really the, the first time that I felt like, oof, I took this cheeky, like, Inglorian Bastards title and, and sort of branded myself with it. And I, again, I've, I've since sort of changed the, the name of the podcast to the long-winded one to match my website. But, but that was more because of, you know, I, there are other stories that I want to tell. So I think I would do that differently if I had to do it over again maybe brand things a little differently. I think I I wish I had done more interviews and it's you know, it takes a lot of work and a lot of like upfront work like reading texts of the scholars, a lot of messages going back and forth. You you want the people to interview to feel comfortable, right? So I spent a lot of my time preparing questions that I thought the, the scholars would want to answer, but also the questions that I thought were interesting and sending those ahead of time and, and sort of, it takes a lot of work, but I, I would, I would definitely have loved to do more of that. I also wish that I had had the courage to, to ask other notable scholars to, to, to come on the, the podcast and, and, and be able to learn from them. But I think overall things turned out pretty well. If I could talk about what I've learned from the Tolkien community, um, not individual scholars, but sort of like a 10,000 foot view, I, I would just come back to the how gracious and giving my people are here. They, they um, Generally speaking, if I needed something or if I had a question, people were just so good about putting me in touch with the right people or giving me people's contact information or pointing me to a new, a different source, something that I hadn't thought about. I, uh, I I just hope that the community stays like this, no matter how big, no matter how pop culture it gets. I hope that our community can keep this this sense of community. Really, that's that's the that's the term. Um, switching gears. Let's see here. What's left? Well, we have the characters are going to be going into Quivien and, and Gundabad and Angband. Um, those are the three last main locations that the characters will be traveling. I have an interview coming up with Doug Anderson and John Ratliff that, I, that I've already recorded. They're, they're fantastic, they're in, not because of my interviewing skills, just because those, those guys are super knowledgeable. Doug Anderson obviously wrote The Annotated Hobbit, John Ratliff, the history of the Hobbit, or, or a brief history of the Hobbit, depending on which copy you pick up. I had plans to be podcasting from England already, um, and and because of the coronavirus, I had to put that trip on hold. And so I have some some folks lined up to do some virtual tours of some of the places that were important to Tolkien. So we have we have four episodes. We're going to do an Oxford, Birmingham, a Warwick, 
and a uh, Cheddar Gorge episode. And so I'm, I'm excited to have those coming up. Of course, we have our last battle episode where I'm going to have, I'm going to try to have some of the cast. And then the last episode, I'm hoping to have a special guest, which I don't really want to divulge right now. But the other plans for the last episode are what, what could be more appropriate than uh, a lay or a poem slash song about this whole experience. So that's 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 my plan for the last very last episode special guest and a lay and then after that for me you know after episode 150 i'll probably take a, a month or two off and then we'll start in on the symbian revival campaign and that is going to take a completely different form uh, this will not be recorded sessions of us playing dungeons and dragons it will be um, some sort of performance base, whether that's me reading, and it's probably not going to just be me reading. It will likely be, each episode will likely be from a certain character's point of view. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to sort of switching that up and sort of changing the style of podcast going forward. But that, that, that puts us probably into September or October of 2020, barring any catastrophes or me getting off schedule. So I just want to thank all of my listeners for these last 131 episodes. Thank you for for coming on this journey with me for however long you managed to make it. Some some of the D and D was you know good, and some of it was dull. And um, you probably kept coming back for these scholars that I've interviewed, and I don't blame you for that. I just want to thank you for being here and, and sharing this experience with me. For now, I'd like to leave you with a little bit of an overview that I did during the Symbian Revival campaign that kind of summarizes the, the history of Symbia as a little preview of things to come. Not necessarily the way the story will be told, but the story itself. Enjoy, and thanks again. Um, well, let me start by just reading a sort of a welcome back um, a little description here. Since humans came to Symbia in the year 700 DR, that's of the Dale Reckoning, there has been strife along her mountains, cliffs, and beaches. When the ruling merchant nobles from the major cities began a civil war, and the capital city of Orgulum was destroyed by a planar rift to the Shadowfell, its leaders sought help from the Netherese Shadowvar to bring peace to its borders. But these shades were to subjugate Sembian people and rule over her shores with an iron hand. In 1484, the floating earth mode of Sakors, the shadow of our capital city, crashed onto the ruins of Orgelin, ending the shadow of our rule in Sembia. Not long after, the Lord High Governor... <laughs> Sonia's fault. <laughs> exactly. Not long after, the Lord High Governor, Thamelon Escaverin II, was assassinated. Symbia quickly became a former great nation of city-states, that is, until a man by the name of Aldar, Aldon Talandar arrived back in Selgant, having been thought dead by his family. Using preternatural wisdom and foresight, he brought Selgant back to prominence. Within two years, he rose to Hulorn within Selgant, that's like the mayor, and later to Lord High Governor of an ailing Symbia. He began a program that he called the Sembian Revival to replenish the temples, roads, bridges, and military of the once great coastal nation. The Talandars and Selgant seemed to have unlimited money pouring forth into the countryside. With swift financial and military victories, Aldon became a folk hero. Then the earthquakes began. New earth moats rose and fell. Cities and coastlines were destroyed. A group of heroes, that's you guys, came forth out of Jario and traveled the countryside looking for information about these earthquakes. They were skeptical of the new leader and his power. In Battle Rise, they discovered a strange beacon that caused strange magical effects similar to the spell plague of old. The military was quickly dispatched to deal with these dissidents. The group trekked through the countryside discovering new information about Aldon and his allies. Though this marks the end of the episode, the road goes ever on. Until next time, join us at longwinded.one and consider giving us a review on Apple Music, Spotify, or really whichever platform you choose.